It is to welcome you this evening. I am Reverend Karen Foster, Minister at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Northern Nevada, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this gathering this evening. This event is our Bobby Tauso Memorial Social Justice Speaker Series, and tonight's event features Beverly Harry. We welcome you, Beverly, and we're delighted to be sponsoring this event. We acknowledge this evening that we occupy Washoe and Paiute lands here in Northern Nevada. I wanna take this opportunity to um, welcome a very special guest, Alexis Hill of the Washoe County Commissioners is here as are various members of the plan staff and organization. We welcome you all. And we're so glad that all of you are here. Please settle in and be comfortable. And Adrian Fisher, a member of our Board of Trustees and organizer of this event, has a few words about the history of our Bobby Tauso Speaker Series. Thank you everyone for being here with us tonight for our Tauso Speaker Series guest lecture, Beverly, Beverly Harry. My name is Adrian Fisher and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Northern Nevada and the chair of the Bobby Talso Memorial Fund for Social Justice. I'm going to share a very brief history of the fund and the speaker series because I know you will want to join us for future speakers. Bobby Talso was a longtime beloved member of UUFNN. And when she passed away in 2010, she left us a fund to continue her social justice work. Bobby believed in the pursuit of improving and understanding the human condition of all people, no matter what their status in life. And so we are blessed to continue her legacy by bringing you periodic speakers to further our collective understanding and action. In the past, we have welcomed such speakers as Tim Wise, an American race activist. You might know of him from his documentary, White Like Me, or his books, Dispatches from the Race War, or Dear White America, and Erica Huggins, a former Black Panther and American educator, to name a few. We are so grateful to Maya and Lisa Telso, Bobby's daughters, for their support and belief in this speaker series. I'd like to introduce them now to share a few words about their mom, and I look forward to seeing you at our future speakers. You can be in the know by visiting our website and signing up for our newsletters. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Maya, and uh, we just wanted to share a, a tiny bit about mom's connection to social justice, but especially to the Native peoples here, um, because that was a cause very close to her heart and the water issues as well. Um, Mom used to say uh, that her first awakening to social justice issues was looking out of a hospital window dressed in her candy striper outfit, um, seeing the smoke rise from the race riots in Detroit in 1943. Um, her first true experience with indigenous peoples probably came a decade later when she boarded a ship to Hawaii and ended up teaching elementary school on Lanai and later on the Big Island. And it was easy to see that her time there, um, in her time there, her heart really opened up to the Hawaiian families as she learned to speak pidgin and learn traditional songs and sang with her students. And these are all stories and things she shared with Lisa and I as we were growing up. Um, in the late 50s, she married Rudy Talso and they both became educators and they arrived in Nevada from California looking for jobs. And for reasons we have now lost to the mists of time, <laughs> Bobby and was asked to be a teacher and Rudy was the, asked to be the principal at Natchez School on, in Nixon on the Pyramid Lake Paiute Reservation. For those of you who are familiar with Nixon, they lived in the stone house. And over time, they earned a small place in the community. Mom was genuine in her curiosity about people and new ways of being, a quality that allowed her to make connections and contribute without imposing herself or her views on others. A few cherished items that we still have from that time are our tiny beaded moccasins, well-worn, 
and a cradle board that were first made, that were made especially for us by members of the community. As well as there being a vintage Nevada magazine highlighting a then legendary field trip with a busload of Natchez students delivering Pyramid Lake Kiwi to the San Francisco Aquarium. Even after they left the reservation, Bobby and Rudy continued their work with Native peoples when in 1968, they participated in one of the first bilingual education pro projects on the Navajo reservation in Dilcon, Arizona. We lived there for the summer and thanks to our parents, we both feel that this was a formative experience that instilled in us a desire to learn about people, cultures and languages different from our own. Um, their connection to the people of Pyramid Lake and Bobby's <clears throat> continued throughout their lives. And we were privileged to have one of her former Natchez students sing at her celebration of life. In 2010. In 2010. <laughs> we are honored and grateful that Beverly Harry is presenting tonight. And we know that mom would be delighted to know that the interconnected web is come full circle. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. It is now my great honor and pleasure to introduce you to Beverly Harry. Beverly is a member of the Dine or Navajo tribe. She lives on the Pyramid Lake Paiute Reservation. Beverly grew up being traditionally raised by her grandmother. She says that early on, she learned her place with the land and respected her place as an equal to everything around her. She says that this was the deepest connection she had while growing up with precious values of survival and learning about the bounty that was to come from planting a garden with her grandma. Now with the organizing work that she does, she works with these values to guard the air and the water. She acknowledges that our earth mother is suffering. So she deepens her work on the river including the shorelines and banks. A river is vital for every living thing in the Truckee Meadows, wildlife, residents of Reno and Sparks, and the Paiute tribe at Pyramid Lake. Beverly, since 2016, has worked as a canvasser and native community organizer for PLAN, the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Northern Nevada, and she is organizer of the River Justice Project. The Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Northern Nevada is proud to present our Bobby Tauso social justice speaker, Beverly Harry. So good evening, my name is Beverly Harry. I am a member of the uh, Navajo tribe. Uh, so I am born, um, I am of the um, uh, Red Bottom clan and I'm born for the Red Forehead clan and that's how I am um, known as a woman. I want to um, begin first by, you know, talking a little bit about um, Bobby Talso. I did know her um, back in 2006. Uh, Bob Fulkerson, with a group of uh, other individuals, had organized a, a, an event on the Pyramid Lake Reservation. <clears throat> And it was with Wilma Mankiller, who is uh, who was a uh, um, uh, Cherokee um, chairwoman for for the longest time, and so Wilma Mankiller was was the um, was the hero of that particular event that we had, and and so that's how I began to. Um, uh, understand, you know, a little bit of uh, Wilma's work, and then also um, 
how I end up getting in contact with with Bobby is um, some sometime after the event in 2006, um, there was a need to return a sweater to uh, a woman. And so that's how I got in contact with Bobby. And um, we just started to talk and um, I was telling her about the jewelry that I had made in the past and she wanted a, a set. So I made her a necklace and some earrings and a bracelet when I del delivered it to her and that's how we became friends. Um, and both Lisa and Maya both have the, um, the, the, the set, you know, at their house. And, um, and then in uh, 2010, Wilma Mankiller passed away. And that was the same time that um, Bobby also uh, passed away. So I just want to thank uh, Maya and Lisa, uh, Karen and uh, Adrian and Phil for um, providing me the opportunity to speak tonight about river justice. And so I will begin. The history of Native people who are indigenous to the mountains and the waters of the Truckee Meadows makes me realize how they have been connected to all of these landscapes. It was the late Orville Barlees who knew of the story where Numu, the Northern Paiutes gathered on P P Vine Mountain with um, Paiutes from the Susanville area um, came to uh, the, the ceremony to harvest cutthroats and uh, kuyui during the spawning season. Their gatherings were important, but Sadly, they were insignificant to white settlers who began occupying lands that belonged to indigenous people. Then we have to uh, consider acknowledging that the Lahan cutthroat trout and the Kuyui suckers brought many blessings and reminded people that, that they were welcome to come together to sing, pray and dance. Therefore, it is important for Native people to begin excelling with their oral history. Indigenous people were provided great memory cards where their wisdom was embedded in stories and within their, their memories, they knew exactly how they were tied to kin and they knew how they were tied to the land uh, through their, their ancestors. To begin developing the Pyramid Lakes um, history of the Truckee River, it can be defined by family ties to Captain Dave Numana. He uh, was born in 1845 and he um, passed into the spirit world in 1919. And he had um, at least six general, general, let me see how I can say this, generational ties to my late husband, Norm Oliver Harry. And Captain Dave was also a grandson to Chief Truckee, who the river is named for. Chief Truckee was a member of the Kuyui Dakota or the Ku Kuyui Eaters. They were members of the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe. It's been over a hundred years when Chief Truckee of the um, Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe began befriending many new white visitors and help to guide them through the mountains to the west. It is my daughter's people who bring the history to this area to a place now controlled by, by a dominant culture. This culture continues and has excluded the tribe's commitment to keeping the well-being of the river as a lifeline to their people downstream. So we go back in, in history to these wet periods where um, we know that they existed and we know um, that the water ran um, constantly and drained on the land. The native people were able to witness these great periods when no impacts existed on these lands. Through evidence found in a cave excavation just north of here, a necklace was found laced with abalone beads, acknowledging people travel far to the Western oceans. Then 
if you can imagine, there were um, pinyon pine, the um, single leaf um, pinyon or the mo um, Pinus monophylla that had a great extent beyond the Sierras into the lands of the Ohlone, the Maidu and the Pomo Indians in the Bay Area of California. Indigenous people are still present on these lands. Here is a picture of um, my daughter with um, Captain Dave Numana. And I'm just really proud of this picture because it was one that um, we end up um, visiting Greg Deal, who is also a member of the um, uh, tribe in Colorado Springs. And so he was able to um, paint this um, gorgeous picture of uh, Captain Dave. And I see um, my, myself as, as continuing to um, bring this, this legacy up for my late husband, Norman Harry. And so back to the Truckee River, um, we know that it had been subjected to catastrophic impacts, which began after gold discovery at Dayton in 1864. Because the mining processes needs, um, of the mining process, processes needs, ore was crushed through stamp mills and smelters to, um, to run uh, their equipment. And smelting of gold and separating impurities required heats of over um, 1,046 cel Celsius or um, 2,150 Fahrenheit degrees. In one particular writing by Eugene M. Hattori, who uh, retired from the Nevada State Museum as a curator, wrote a resourceful piece, Northern Paiutes on the Comstock. In his finding, he found that mining um, was really, really exploitive. It was estimated that 564 cords of wood were being utilized daily for the, these extractive processes. Therefore, mining within these times shouldn't be romanticized or glorified. Because of these extreme needs for fuel, forest at lands in the round of Virginia City, Washoe Valley and Tahoe National Forest, became the sole targets for combustion for smelters and melting point of metals. Through my experience and work history with the sampling of benthic areas of Pyramid Lake, and that's uh, you know at the bottom, there was core sampling done, which revealed extreme pollution on the river, which directly related it to logging and mercury amalgamation within the Washoe Valley. Both the Truckee River and Steamboat Springs were recipients of the impacts of extreme exploitation and immense biological casualties. Frank Mullins' piece on the research he did on the Truckee River uh, just recently revealed um, within the Reno News and Review on March 29th that um, there were huge impacts. And these two articles that he um, came out with um, on the Truckee River. Uh, they were entitled in Indigenous River and the Truckee's Blighted Banks. I'm not gonna go into detail um, about those um, particular articles because he does a fantastic job in explaining exactly um, what he uh, was able to um, research and he he's, He's a great investigative reporter who was a, a, a friend to um, my late husband, Norm. So uh, Phil will be uh, dropping those in the chat. And then um, now we'll begin talking about um, the, the, the current um, project that we have been working on. And the, this particular video was shown to the Truckee Meadows Water Authority um, about a month and a half ago, maybe two months ago.
So Phil, do you wanna sh um, sh share this three minute video? Hi, my name is Beverly Harry. I am the Native Community Organizer for the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. I thank the Tamwa Board for listening to my public comment. We will begin by providing the Tamwa Board before and after videos of the areas we cleaned up through volunteer efforts which were Indigenous-led. We thank our communities, organizations, and other volunteers who stepped up to allow nurturing for the river so in turn that power can continue to be the lifeline for all communities who depend on it. On February 4th, a group of volunteers began working on a small project to provide burritos to houseless individuals along the river. Our group began a reconnaissance effort to developing relationships with the houseless. Trash bags, food, and other areas of assistance were provided. Through this effort, we found a problem that was being ignored, justice for the Truckee River. Below Tom Wharf is the Parma Lake Paiute Indian Reservation. This is where the endangered Kuyui and the threatened Laha and Cutthroat Trout are found. It is this reason why Indigenous people are really concerned about the upstream pollution problems. Here on the river corridor, we began assessing the problem with solid waste. What became evident is illegal dumping, trash dis distribution along the freeway, which follows the route to the landfill and houseless encampments. After six river cleanups using a large dump truck, we hauled approximately 200 cubic yards of trash, metal, bikes, carpet, tarps and household waste. We've raised approximately $1,823 for six hauls of trash to the dump. Of that amount, the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada paid $450, and we also received a 20-yard bin supplied by Keep Truck and Meadows Beautiful to the University Farms this past weekend. We continue to work with our community upstream and downstream while working with the many organizations who continue to help with this river justice effort. Thank you so much. Mute yourself. Am I unmuted now? Okay. Since the the video had um, been presented to the Tumwa board, the work has gotten easier. The River Justice team was contacted by the Washoe County Commissioner Alexis Hill, uh, trying to define ways uh, the justice team could be supported. As stated in the video, we were solely supported by donations. Um, from um, people uh, within the community, outside of the community, Georgia. Um, and then we also um, got some money from the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. It was so important to begin working with the commissioners. Alexis Hill was able to provide seven uh, dumpsters and even came out on the large cleanup we had last Saturday. We thank her and Kitty Junk for showing up and spending hours picking up micro trash and targeting their focus on solutions. So if we had to uh, recreate our story on river justice, it is at Lake Tahoe where we would begin. Back in the 1930s, Lake Tahoe began taking water samples and worked to monitor various parameters in the lake. I believe the lake has had the longest set of water quality data than any other body of water in the world. The water clarity had been the premier char characteristic and had been key to monitor monitoring lake health. Limnologists use what is known as a second disc to monitor clarity as it is sent through the water column. When the X on the, uh, on the disc disappears, it is where the depth measurement of the Seki readings are taken. 
And so uh, Phil will uh, share this uh, picture of the Seki disc. So unfortunately, the water clarity uh, for Lake Tahoe has gotten worse. In the late uh, 1960s, the Seki readings were uh, well above 100 feet. Now uh, reported in 2019, it is at about uh, 62.7 uh, feet, but fluctuations are um, being seen uh, daily according to Jeff Shadlow with the Tahoe Environmental Resource Center. Uh, he works there as the executive director. And so when you look at this um, other um, graph that um, Phil is gonna drop, on screen for you, you'll be able to, to look at the diminishing values of the annual average Seki depth at Lake Tahoe. So at one time it was more than a hundred uh, feet and it's now being compromised with, um, with values uh, close to, um, I think 62.7 and, and I think it was recorded at, at 60. Um, back in 2017. So what this means is that there's an increasingly more, um, more nitrogen and phosphorus resulting in eutrophication or human impacts. With these nutrients, the response from uh, lake processes through energy sequestration um, creates a lot of um, paraphyton or algae, which creates obscurity within the water column. And it's almost like having a, a lake cataract, uh, you know, as you look down and you can't see as clearly. And, and so it, it really um, obstructs some of the um, uh, water that you, you could actually be um, looking through. So the Tahoe Environmental Research Center, or TURC, was developed through limnology research funding, which brought Charles Goldman and his uh, science team from UC Davis. UC Davis is the same team who was responsible for assisting the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe in teaching them how to develop intense monitoring on the lake in the 1990s. This is one of the ways the tribe achieve water quality standards. UC Davis essentially brought institutional capability to the resource team at Pyramid. Currently, there are probably more water quality technicians, um, limnologists and experts within these two bodies of water than are employed within the whole state of Nevada. So in other words, who's watching the baby in the cradle. There is more public advocacy needed because surely there are more people employed by the state to approve mining permits and improving water rights applications than to safeguard water. Here in the Truckee Meadows, we have declining management because the economy is a big thing. Who is the one who is continually keeping watch over the cradle again. We are made to think our government has everything under control, but it's spinning out of control. No one is ever, uh, no one is coordinating the problems and impacts on the river. So where heavy monitoring is being completed on both ends of the Truckee River watershed at Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake, the heavy pollution throughout the river corridor becomes the epicenter of what is wrong with our society and our governments. So we have um, a picture here, um, and I think it was in 2004, maybe it was, I think it was in 2004 when Al Gore and, and um, um, Bill Clinton came out to um, uh, do some of the monitoring of, of Lake Tahoe. And it's really, really interesting that, um, you know, through this uh, publicity um, of Lake Tahoe and water clarity, um, 
I think they end up getting a, a lot of a lot of money for um, monitoring efforts. And Jeff told me today that um, Jeff Shadlow from from the Tahoe Environmental Research Center. He told me today that you know it wasn't Bill and and Al that ended up coming um, over and handing them over a check. They actually got the um, the the money through the Environmental Protection Agency, and so it's really important to realize that you know if we can become stewards in, in a better way um, and, and to think about the possibilities of you know, safeguarding our water and, and trying to behave in a different way, this is the time to act. And so um, the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency continues to keep vigil with their attention on Lake Tahoe and are able to send water, water down um, through um, Truckee and Farad and Verdi which is in, in pretty good shape. And then, um, and then we get over to Reno Sparks where, where the cities can't maintain the, the actual water quality. All of a sudden it's just like, it's not important anymore. So there's something wrong with the picture and we really, really need to fix it. Then it flows further downstream to diminish it, uh, diminish its water quality even more before it gets to um, Pyramid Lake. In 1992, the Pyramid Lake um, Paiute tribe um, brought a lawsuit against EPA uh, because of the river um, situation. And it was actually noted that um, the river was dominated by effluent. As a result, $12 million was set aside after the, the tribe ended up um, winning the, the lawsuit. $12 million was set aside to begin addressing water quality within um, with Tamwa, the Sierra Pacific Power Company at that time, and then the city of Reno Sparks and the, and the county. $12 million additional dollars came from these entities to help guide a healthy transition within the river system. Therefore, it's important for politicians to work on getting up to speed on what had been uh, accomplished in the past and getting back to addressing the public good. As a recent plea to remove people from the river for their own protection with rising waters, we have a great deal of trash to remove on the banks of the river and must ask our governments to step, on the, step up on the work guarding the river from disrespect, unmanaged problems, and unbalanced planning. We see how um, these priorities um, are, are um, well, we see how these priorities kind of uh, become uh, very important when there's uh, high uh, touristy locations, um, then uh, areas where, um, uh, views of, uh, of society, you know, it's like having to uh, deal with this houseless situation. There's a lot of people that judge them. And these people are, are you know, they can't take care of themselves. And so they're peeping out um, from behind the tarps and the plywood along the river. And we realize, you know, we must change. We have to change. I do also respect houseless individuals and, and through our efforts, we work, we work, um, we work without judgment. And um, I do also know we need to provide housing for the houseless and we should begin with the people on the river as we need to keep a, an individual eye on our lifeline. So there were many organizations we worked with in our river justice effort. Like I said, you know, we didn't have um, very much time um, to uh, deal with all of these situations because the uh, uh, rising waters, and then we're um, also having to think about, you know, how we were going to take care of all of the the funding issues. It was like we were just begging for money, and um, so. We began um, working with um, 
different organizations like the Reno um, Food Systems, um, um, Mark, Mike Carson LLC, Myers a Tree Care Ser Service, the Nature Conservancy, um, Washoe County, um, the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe, the chairwoman from the um, Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe came out and the Reno Sparks Indian Colony um, have, have been really, really supportive of our work. Be Friendly Reno, Good Earth Composting and so many more. So as the river otters, as we're called, we're the Patsuku and we bring happiness, we bring uh, a, a bounty, uh, we bring you know, a, a different uh, type of optimism to um, this river. And our indigenous led team brought a connection we share with on our non-native friends who, who brought great healing and understanding to the problems we face right now and the growing concern of access to clean water. I wanna be a better person, but we need to be a better government. And I know I am in solidarity in solidarity with the River Otter team, known as the Patsugu, to ask for the same. I want to thank Avery Wyatt, who showed up at one of the first cleanups um, shortly after my husband died. And, um, and he dedicated that, that cleanup to, to Norm. So I'm really, really grateful for that. I'm grateful for the inspiration that he brought um, to the team uh, during that time. And I also um, thank for all of the indigenous people for showing up and, and showing up for what is important to our future. Our work would not have been possible for the truck provided free of charge by Josh Myers with Myers Tree Care Service. So we thank him, um, his um, uh, website, our web address is um, um, myerstreecare.com. So if you guys are needing um, someone to help you out with a healthy tree or um, you know, provide you with, with um, um, a recommendation, you know, he's really, really good to um, talk to. So let's continue to bring justice to Chief Truckee and our indigenous river and as my late husband said, what is good for the fish is good for the people. The final video is the inspiring work of my daughter and her affection to Pyramid Lake. The connection video is eight minutes long and uh, Phil will go ahead and play that and then we'll come back um, and then we'll, we'll um, provide you with some more information for the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women event tomorrow. When I think about home, I th always think about the water. I think about how the generations before me have had this connection to the water. I think about the fish that are swimming within the lake. That water is embedded within our DNA to protect it. Ready? Now we fish. No autumn hairy minania, no kuyui popping in other way, no kuyui to cut a dene no. I was born in Reno, but I've spent my whole life here at Pyramid Lake. I grew up on the reservation, so a lot of my childhood was spent outside. I see it as my responsibility to protect these areas. The biggest issue that we've had is the construction of Derby Dam. It did cause our fish to go extinct. Thankfully, we were able to recover that species. Indigenous peoples have always been caretakers of the land. We still see ourselves within that role. Come here, too. Come here. I learned how to fish through my parents. Both my mom and dad started taking me fishing from a young age. 
I remember how excited I was when I caught my first fish. And within our traditions here, if you catch your first fish, you're supposed to give that to an elder. So I remember my first fish, I gave it to my grandma. I learned how to fly fish about a year ago. When I hooked my first fish on the fly, it was just so exciting to be able to use your hands and to reel in that line and to feel that fish tugging on that line with you. After I caught my first fish, I was hooked on fly fishing and I wanted to continue learning how to improve my skills. I'm excited to go on this trip to Washington. I've never fished anywhere else really besides Pyramid Lake. So I'm excited to go learn more about the steelhead fish that are up there. It's really cool that we're gonna be on this river that merges with the ocean. To be able to fish for the steelhead, which are so connected to both of these waters. I've actually never seen big fish within a river before, and I don't even know how deep the river is. I have, I have no clue, so it'll be interesting. It's gonna be a big learning experience for sure. I met Sarah last year at Pyramid Lake Trout Camp. When I met her, I was still so new to the fly fishing world. She was very welcoming towards me, and I think that's really important when you're getting involved in a new sport. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't the weather gorgeous? It's amazing. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't be nervous. We're gonna try to keep everybody, uh, we're gonna keep everybody safe. We're gonna keep everybody warm. We're gonna do fly out this, uh, monster. Even though I've been fishing my whole life, there's not a, a lot of fly fisher people who live within the reservation. Because I didn't see it, I didn't think it was an accessible sport. It always seemed very expensive to me. I have a friend who's a fly fishing guide, and he just took me out one day and said, you know what, I'm gonna teach you how to fly fish. And it made me realize that there's so much more I can learn. So Autumn, you're gonna have to pull it back up. So right now what you're doing, you're dragging. So I'm at this point where I am obsessed and I do want to get better at fishing and continue developing my techniques. I did too, I, I, I thought it was a fish. So whenever I travel to places, I always think about the original stewards of those lands. And I think about the indigenous peoples from those areas and the territory that we're on when we're fishing. I'm thinking of those things and I'm thinking about my impact when I travel to those places. I think what was reaffirmed for me in this trip is that we need to be doing a lot more work to protect these things that are so sacred to a lot of people, especially indigenous communities who have always relied on these fish. And if we're ever to lose these species, then we have to think about how that would impact these different communities. I don't usually call myself an activist because for me it feels like the work that I do to protect the fish and the water, it's a, more of a responsibility than anything else. Every time I travel or go someplace new, I always learn something. I always carry that with me. 
My role is to pass on that knowledge to other young people. I want to get them more involved in fishing and caring about our fish and our water. It's about remembering the connection that we have to those fish. Without those fish, I wouldn't be who I am today. Beverly, thank you so, so much for sharing with us your story tonight and your passion for the water and for justice for the river. Thank you so much for being with us and being our Bobby Towson Memorial Speaker. We have just a few minutes for questions for Beverly. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat box and we might not get to all of them, but um, We'll be here for a few more minutes for an opportunity for questions and answers. And we do have one already. Um, and someone is asking, why is the river water rising? Is there more snow melt into Lake Tahoe? I, well, there's um, actually two types of snow packs. There's a low snow pack and a high snow pack. And what we're seeing right now, the low snowpack is the one that um, melts first. It's at a lower elevation, um, a place where uh, heat temperature can melt those uh, waters a little bit more quickly. And then we have the high snowpack, which is uh, meant, meant for the mountains to absorb um, some of the uh, moisture throughout um, the springtime or into the, the summer. And so the longer the snowpack um, is on the mountain, I think we can see that as um, being really, really positive because we want to see water stay on the, the land a whole lot longer. Um, we don't want um, areas to, to become dry um, because then we would, know that we need more more precipitation right now we're not seeing that pre precipitation it's really really sad thank you and the next question is what concrete actions can we take to protect the Truckee river i think I think that's a really important um, question. I think we have to begin asking our, our governments to come up with a, a, a better plan that's in place that um, serves uh, the whole entire river. So then we become um, more um, uh, involved in, in how we're coordinating um, the, the river. So like right now, we're seeing like, um, you know, cryptosporidium, we're seeing um, giardia, we're seeing E. coli um, throughout the river system. And, and with people living so close to the, the, the river, the E. coli counts are probably really, really um, high. Well, who's monitoring that? And how come we don't get a report? That should be the impetus to say, hey, we do not, we can't afford people on the river. The people on the river need to be placed into to housing first. And then that's when we began to address, you know, um, looking at the um, particular uh, areas of, of restoration, we can start to um, make recommendations as to what areas need, need um, um, pertinent um, uh, management. And I think those are uh, things that we can all address together. Um, but um, there should be some, some type of program 
um, that's in place that coordinates all of the efforts, not casually, um, not, not for fun, but to really um, impress upon the river that we care for it. And I think that um, uh, Truckee River program is something that, um, you know, Washoe County and, and um, uh, the city of Reno Sparks should be uh, working on managing together because uh, there's already um, uh, documents. There's the Truckee River Operating Agreement and then there's the Truckee River Fund. There's also, um, uh, you know, all of these different uh, governments, the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe, what do you think, you know? We also need to begin advocating for um, indigenous people um, in, in some of these situations. So when we have organizations that are out there um, and we don't know exactly how to be, um, begin bringing uh, indigenous people into the conversation, people need to look to the right side and then they have to look to the left side and see who is sitting on their board. Now, if it's, um, you know, mostly white, then we know that we have a, a, a change to make. Now, if there's inclusion that is happening within um, some of these um, organizations, then begin um, developing budgets that would uh, assure your work in indigenous um, places. And I think that, that that's one of the things that we want to um, promote within um, all of the advocacy, you know, it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Um, and Maya is asking something like the kayak park in downtown Reno, is that more of a positive or a negative impact on the river? It looks pretty fun. <laughs> I can't, I can't roll. Um, I can rock and roll, but um, I can't roll in a kayak. I don't know. I think I would say that the river should just run the way it's supposed to. Um, and that if it includes people that are recreating on it, then let's keep it safe for them. Right, and let's also assure that we're not um, bringing more cement to to the area and and um, anchoring um, boulders into these places with um, those type of um, development. And we've already um, changed the river to a point where we're really really controlling it. It doesn't have a, it doesn't have the ability to meander like a natural river. And so we need to um, really look at how do we begin uh, taking um, waste management off the river? How do we take the, the junk car uh, companies and all of the recycling um, um, companies off of the, the river and offering them better places where they can um, do, do their work? They don't need to be on the river. I need to be on the river and the Northern Paiutes need to be on the river. And I think there should be a place set aside for, for um, uh, indigenous uh, communities to uh, bring back um, the, those songs, those stories, those prayers that meant so much to them. And it was really, really cruel the way the, um, the railroad project uh, develop um, right along uh, the downtown area. There were um, uh, remains that were found. And I think there was probably 11, 11 to 13 people that were found in that, that area. And they were just like, it wasn't like a really, really big deal for anybody, but those were somebody's ancestors. It's, it's really, really sad when we are, um, you know, doing the things like that to, indigenous communities. So, um, you know, I fret, um, but I also think that we need to um, be better people. We need to be guided by something other than money. Thank you, Beverly. 
Um, Tanner is asking, what kind of citizen-based water testing methods do we have? The fires last summer really increased our awareness of air quality, but how can water quality be something that people in our area can monitor themselves? Well, I think that um, that's a great question. Any type of water quality um, can be measured two ways. Um, it's actually uh, developing a citizen science group um, uh, to go and, you know, get the um, uh, bottles from, from the state water lab and then go and uh, learning how to um, take those samples with, um, you know, rubber gloves and to uh, learn how to filter it. But you also um, are provided different types of um, work using like the hot method and it's just, um, you know, these, if you have a, a um, sample bottle, you would just, um, you know, tear open the little packets. They're already pre-measured and everything and just shake it up. And then if it turns blue, you just look according to, you know, the, the, um, the color measuring and um, submit it that way. But also we could um, learn to advocate a little bit more saying, um, you know, should the city of Reno Sparks be um, testing more? Should they be sampling more? Should they be monitoring more? But also uh, with the whole state of Nevada, if there are more people that are working in Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake on, um, on water, then we really need to advocate for more. We have to put place pressure on the um, state governments to, um, you know, bring that um, policy work forward so uh, we can um, provide, uh, you know, some, some recommendations to them. But I think it, it, it has to, um, you know, none of the people should have to, um, um, go into their pocket to raise money to uh, monitor water. That should be the government's job. And that's when um, the public good is actually um, going into, into um, effect. And that's what we want to see. We wanna see um, the, the government working for us and not working for, for corporations or, or, or for developers. Um, you know, when, when have they said to, to us, what do you guys need, you know? What, um, do you guys need um, bathrooms in the downtown area? You know, I see all of these women that are just running all over and trying to find a bathroom. I'm one of them. Diane is, is asking, she's saying that she's aware of two water treatment plants dumping treated water into the Truckee. What effect does this have on the river? Well, the Truckee River is already in, in a situation as it has a third party um, uh, clause, I guess, with the Environmental Protection Agency. It's called the total um, maximum daily, daily load. And so, it's the Truckee River is considered an impaired river. And so when we begin um, building and we begin um, looking at, you know, how people are disposing of um, uh, chemicals on their, their, their lawns um, and not t taking the, the proper precautions because, uh, you know, these chemical companies are throwing, you know, everything on the shelf that, uh, they could possibly put in front of people. They're putting Roundup, they're putting ortho products. They're putting, um, you know, great names like Habitat on, on the market to begin selling off. But the other situation is, um, you know, do you need downing for your clothes? Um, should we be trying to really work on, on developing our own um, behavioral changes, and then also looking at ways to um, look at the, the um, drug uh, problem within our, our area. Are there a lot of opiates 
then in the future with the, these endocrine disrupting chemicals, they're called ADCs, um, is it gonna cause a problem for um, uh, amphibians down, down river? Are the amphibians gonna be um, later um, producing two heads or a fin in a place where it, there should be um, something else? But you know, there's a possibility um, uh, that these things can happen. I think within bivalves of uh, the area of Seattle, they um, did samples of them, and opiates were were found within their um, within their their um, muscle tissue. And they're constantly just you know sucking in water, filtering water for everybody um, to have better water quality. And here, you know, we're really um, increasing some contamination um, dangers for them as well. Nancy Ann is asking, since the Truckee feeds Pyramid Lake, what entities are checking water quality and the quantity of water entering the lake to meet legal requirements? So there's um, four, four different um, um, quarterly locations, and I don't want to sp speak too much um, for, for the tribe because that's not my place. I'm not um, uh, an employee there, but the, uh, the riparian corridor is monitored um, pretty frequently. The um, tribe has its water quality standards, and so there is um, um, also uh, two locations, uh, Station 93 and Station 96 on the um, Pyramid Lake, um, on Pyramid Lake to monitor surface water and to sample surface water. So these um, individuals are, are, are pretty um, impressive. You know, they know their water. The um, Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe probably had the best water team when it was going through the Truckee River Operating Agreement and through the um, 101, uh, what, what was it, 101-618 um, water, water settlement with um, Senator Harry Reid. Very, very smart individuals. And our last two questions, Beverly, I'll put them together for you. Uh, Julie is asking how much BLM land is adjacent to the river. And then Scott's, Scott wants to know if the Kuyui have started running yet. Um, I'll go ahead and take the second question first. I think with the uh, Kuyui, um, uh, they're, they're gonna be waiting first for um, turbid waters. So they need, um, you know, some kind of cloaking device. So then they'll be a little bit more successful in um, uh, getting to their, their spawning grounds. And so when they don't have the turbid waters, then they're um, um, easy prey for, for pelicans, the American um, white pelican. And so um, when they're in turbid waters, and that means that the, um, the, a low snowpack has already gone gone by, and now we're starting to see a surge. You know, the temperatures are warming up, and then we start to see a surge of all of this water that's coming down to the river. That's why it's so critical for for people to to come off of the river, like right now, like tomorrow, yesterday. You know, and um, so we really uh, will begin seeing seeing their. Um, uh, seeing them migrate up to the mouth of the um, river at Pyramid Lake. And um, there's right now, um, when I look at the mouth of the river where the mixing actually happens from the lake to the, the, um, the lake to the river, right in that area, there's uh, so many um, pelicans. So um, these, um, fish have to run the gauntlet. And so that should be happening within a couple of weeks. And then the last question was BLM. Um, uh, I don't know, I just know that those are native lands. 
and that, that the federal government took these lands inappropriately. And Beverly, could you tell us when the next river justice cleanup event is? Well, we made a decision um, as a group um, to um, get off of the river because of, of the increasing in-stream flows. Um, when we first started the uh, river justice cleanup, it was, uh, the river was running at 299 uh, cubic feet per second. And then when we checked on Saturday, I think it was running at 802. So it went up 500 CFS. And when I go down, down to the river, you know, I just see, um, you know, where tents are, there, there's water running in back of those tents now. So um, I don't know, I, I just get really, really worried about, you know, these needles. Um, and both Kitty, Kitty Jung and Alexis Hill were, were available to see um, what, what the problem is. Now, if there was a, um, a, a, a way that we can um, advocate for, um, you know, people to get off of the river as soon as possible, possible and take, take them to higher ground or take them to a ballpark. What's wrong with the ACES ballpark? You know, let's get them over there. Let's um, get them away because, you know, sometimes, um, you know, they can't, they can't take care of themselves. Thank you so much, Beverly. The invitation is ours to consider carefully what has moved us this evening and what action we will take for river justice. Beverly would like to invite you to a special event tomorrow from 4 to 530 that's being put on by plan the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Northern Nevada. <clears throat> that aims to develop vital awareness for the missing and murdered indigenous women across the Great Basin and within Indian country. This struggle is centered on the crosshairs of indigenous people within the US and Canada and the search for justice for their missing and murdered sisters, daughters, mothers, aunts, cousins, grandmothers, and their unborn. Another invasion of colonization from Western culture perpetuated on indigenous women. So you're invited to attend that event with Beverly tomorrow. Um, and the informa information on that is appearing in the chat box uh, to access that event. If you're not feeling finished this evening and you would like to have more conversation about what you've heard, we're gonna close the event, but then we're gonna give you an opportunity to have a 15 or 20 minute discussion in a small group, if you would like to do that. And Beverly will get around to as many of the groups as she can. Uh, so if you would like to stay on for a few minutes for more discussion, please do that. And once again, thank you for joining us this evening. Let's join in the work. I look for an invitation to join a group if you would like more discussion. Thank you so much for being part of this event tonight. Be well and good night.